How's it going everybody? Welcome back to set 6 and today we are getting on with chapter 9 of the Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth Breakdown series. We're getting close. We're getting real close. We're getting there. Although we got some pretty beefy chapters coming up. Thankfully, this isn't one of them. It's not that big of a chapter, although there is a fair bit to talk about and there are a lot of side quests that I hate in this chapter. So, yeah. You're probably going to get me whinging about Gongaga at some point as well. I, I, I'm sorry, I won't be able to stop myself. I, I just won't. I just won't. Anyway, like the video, subscribe for future content because, you know, once we finish these breakdowns, the theory video is going to start coming thick and fast. So you need to be ready for that. But let's get on with it. So in the previous chapter, we did the whole exploration of the Corel region. We had a lot of Barrett backstory. Uh, we had the events at the Gold Saucer. We had the first of the dates. We had a lot of stuff go on. Lots of things went on in the previous chapter, but by the end of it, we were given a buggy and we were told to head towards Gongaga. And, you know, that's what we're going to do. We're going to get in the buggy and we're going to drive over the river and we're going to head into Gongaga. Now, we get to the edge of the forest, everyone jumps out of the buggy, and Cloud has a little bit of a moment after we get told by Kate Sith that there's a town up ahead. Cloud has a little bit of a moment where he feels like he's been here before. And, if you remember back to Crisis Core, he has been here before. Zack and Cloud come through the Gongaga area. Zack discovers what's happened to the Gongaga reactor and the state of his town afterwards and things like that. But the town's all kind of sealed off and Cisne is there and Holland is there and Genesis is there and a load of stuff goes down. So we don't actually really get to interact with anyone in Gongaga. But Cloud's been here before. He knows this place. He remembers this place. You could also argue that because he's got some of Zack's memories potentially stored within him, then that's where this memory also comes from. So, two avenues where this can come from. I think it's probably the first one, the farmer. You know, he's actually been through here and remembers it. But you can't rule out the second. Now, we head through the forest, and it's pretty easy to navigate your way to the Gongaga village. It's not that difficult. And while we're on the way there, Barrett's kind of pressing Kate Sith for some information. You know, some inside information. And Kate Sith kind of offers up a little bit about how much Rufus spends on his suit, but that's it. It's a waste of time. We ain't going to get anything unless it's what Kate Sith wants to give us. We'll leave that one where it is, and we'll keep pressing on into Gongaga. As we arrive in the town, we notice the giant mushrooms, and everyone has a little chat about the mushrooms. And the first time I played it, I didn't realise how upsetting these mushrooms were going to be to me, but, you know, it, it gets bad. It gets bad. Anyway, we get ambushed. We get ambushed by the Gongaga Defense Force, and they're being led by a very familiar face if you've played Crisis Core, Cisne. And Cisne instantly recognizes us, like, oh, you. And then instantly backpedals on that, like, oh no, thought you were someone else. But Cisne has 100% recognized Cloud, 100%. And whether that's because she's still receiving information now at this point, or whether it's because, you know, Crisis Core, either way, she recognizes Cloud. She also recognises Kate Sith, knowing what the deal is there. So it's definitely a Cisne who's loosely connected with Shimmer and the Turks still. And I know that we're discussing the Proto Relics in separate video in the future, but if you do do the Proto Relics quests in this area, you will eventually be encountered by Cisne, who's a little bit like, oh, what are you doing here? So she knew that someone had been messing around with these facilities, these Shimmer facilities, and she came to check it out. My only thought is that she doesn't want the people of Gongaga to know that she's ex-Shimra, because, you know, the reactor blew up. They're probably a bit pissed at Shimra, so it might not go down the best if they knew that Cisne was. So it works out for everyone to just keep quiet about this. Cloud seems like he pieces the truth together during the Proto-Relic quest, so, you know, there's not really too many secrets at the minute. But she doesn't talk to Cloud about Zack. She doesn't talk to Cloud about how she knows who he was, you know, how she recognised him at the start of this Gongaga section. So yeah, standard Turk behaviour. Moving on. Cisne points us in the direction of a hill where we'll get a good view of the reactor, but she also says to Kate Sith, make sure you pay your respect, basically saying that Shinra, you know, is obviously accountable for what happened here in Gongaga. So pay your respects to those who died in the incident that Shinra essentially caused. Th that's what it feels like to me. I might be missing something there, let me know if I am. But that, that's what it feels like to me. I can't remember if there's something a little bit more intertwined between Cisne and Reeve. I don't think there is. Sorry, did I say Reeve? That, that's a secret, obviously. Anyway, we go to the top of the hill. We get there, we see the memorial. Cisne and Kate Sith, and everyone kind of has a little moment of reflection. 
Yuffie obviously acts like an idiot, not knowing what reflection is. So, you know, but I feel like it's just Yuffie trying to fit in with the group. Feels like that's what it is. She's a, she's a little bit confused and she wants to fit in with the group, so she just kind of copies them. And then Kate Sith tells the story about the reactor about three years ago, how it blew up, it was old, it couldn't handle the stress. Shinra didn't maintain it, clearly. And that's what led to this tragedy. It makes you think, is there going to be more to this? Are we going to have something else exposed about the Gongaga reactor at some point in part three, maybe? I don't know. It feels like this may just be what it is. This may just be on face value. The reactor went boom because Shinra forgot about it, essentially, and just neglected it. But you never know. There could be more. There could be more. And it could be tied to the weapon that's appeared. Because while it's only recently appeared, there could be something that goes on before a weapon, you know, some sort of prerequisite to a weapon appearing or being able to appear in a location. Maybe there's a prerequisite like that and that's what popped the reactor. It's possible, but like I say, it looks like it could be what it is at face value. And Barrett shows his disgust at the memorial, kind of like, yeah, this one little memorial from Shimra doesn't fix things, not in the slightest. So, uh, you know, good on you, Barrett. Stay strong. Anyway, moving on. Cisne tells us that her house has an open door policy and we should get some rest there. But there's a few other things that we can do, so we're going to go and do them first. You get an opportunity to chat to a few members of the party and kind of boost their affinity with you. You can chat to Red, you can chat to Tifa. And it's just pretty standard stuff, really. Nothing major. But there's one in the area, and I'm sure you can guess which one it is, that is important. And that's going and speaking to Aerith. Cloud catches a glimpse of Aerith going into someone's house. So Cloud runs over, follows behind and opens the door and just walks in. It's quite rude. Quite rude. But what we've stumbled upon here is Aerith meeting Zack's parents. And immediately Zack's parents see Cloud, see his eyes and they're like, Oh, you're a soldier. Do you know Zack? Have you met Zack? And as soon as they say his name, he hears the Zack, but then the surname's gone and a little Genova flash takes over him and the headache happens. And it's another example of Cloud's memory and the Genova within him actively manipulating his memory on the fly, repressing certain things, changing certain things, just making alterations on the fly to keep Cloud on the path that he's on. That's what it seems like happens here. You know, his memory has fully repressed Zack and, like, got rid of him at this point still. So his brain just takes over. Now, Zack's parents talk about how Zack used to always be in touch and write to them, but then radio silence a few years ago, which we all know coincides with the events of Crisis Core and the death of Zack. And Zack's parents do not know. They have not been informed of what happened. And it's pretty rough. But they do recognise Aerith from Zack's letters where Zack had been writing, saying about this girl that he'd met. And Aerith's kind of really nice to him and says that, you know, if we do find anything about Zack or we find Zack, we'll tell him to get in touch. But it's a pretty sad moment still because, you know, we know that Zack's dead. And even if he's alive in the other world, he's not alive in this world. So, it's a sad moment. It's a very sad moment. you got to feel for Zack's parents. I mean, is there a future possibility where we see Zack reunited with his parents back in this world? I don't know. We don't really know what the mechanics between the worlds are and if that would even be a possibility. But hopefully at some point we can get some closure for Zack's parents. Anyway, they offer Aerith and Cloud some food, but Aerith's like, no, 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 we've got to go. She's obviously feeling mega uncomfortable and pretty guilty, as we'll find out in a second. And so we all head outside. But Cloud kind of lingers for a minute, kind of like, Zack? Hmm... You know, you can tell that Clouds, he knows that something's not right, but he just can't access the memory at the minute. Anyway, outside, Aerith's feeling guilty about kind of bringing up all these emotions and all these feelings, and Cloud reassures her, but then he goes straight in and just asks her, so, Zack, do you still like him? Hey, are you into him? Are you into Zack? I'm just asking for a friend. <laughs> and Aerith responds, like, he's never given me a reason not to, and Cloud kind of <laughs> Cl cloud takes that badly i think i feel like cloud takes that badly at first he's kind of like oh forget that loser he's not seen you for five years Pfft. sack that guy but then he says i'm not being funny but if the guy's been missing for five years and is a soldier he's dead but just before you can finish that thought again genova kicks in and it's like it's trying to suppress that memory of what happened to zach again just holding back those memories he knows that something's there he just can't access it. Anyway, we head over to Cisne's house. 
Yuffie's lay on the couch having a little sing song about Materia and how she's bored and everything like that. She's doing well. She's doing well. But Cloud goes for a little nap just to like get his energy reserves up. You know, he needs he need to nap. No sit-ups this time again. He's learning. We get woken up though by Yuffie sprinting in, bursting open the door like, oh, there's something coming from the reactor. Something might be affecting my Materia. Quick, let's go. So Cloud jumps up, grabs his sword, heads outside. And this is where we get one of my favorite pieces of music in the game, if I'm going to be honest with you. The Weapons Awaken music. Oh my god, I was not ready for this when it kicked in. And wow. Wow, it was good. Wowza. So we head to the top of the hill. And when we get to the top of the hill, we can hear the massive noise coming from the reactor. And Barrett's there. Everyone's here. And we decide to go on a little adventure over to the reactor to, you know, see what's going on. Cisne tells us that they've tried to investigate as this has been going on for the last couple of days, but they were stopped by black cloaked figures swirling around in a big kind of barrier. Interesting. Sounds like our friends the Whispers are back in town, and we're going to get into the Whispers in this video. Like, this chapter isn't as long as some of the other chapters as far as the story content, but the ramifications of some of the stuff that goes on in this chapter is pretty big pretty big indeed so we'll get to it anyway barrett cloud red and kate decide that we're the stealth team oh yeah we're gonna sneak in and get things sorted leaving the girls behind to just kind of chill and knit and cook or something like that i don't know i i don't i don't know if this is a good idea i think we should all go in but the team splits and the groups head their separate ways so we're gonna head to the reactor when we're on the way to the reactor barrett starts talking about like wow the whispers are back what's going on here and kate sith like non the wiser as to what a whisper even is because Kate Sith didn't encounter them. Red explains what the whispers are and Barrett points out that we've already defeated Fate and Destiny once so why are the whispers back? And Red suggests that they're now presiding over a new Fate and Destiny, ours. But that's not quite the case I don't think and we'll see more on that when we get there. But Red's working with minimal information so you know. Another interesting point that Red brings up is the fact that Cisne can even see the Whispers. And I'd, I'd suggest that some of the other people around Gongaga can see the Whispers as well. There's something to keep an eye on. We finally reach the reactor after running and running and climbing and jumping and running and climbing. And when we get there, we see the Whispers. Similar to the Whispers that we saw in Remake, but different. This time they've got kind of like a black-purple orb in the centre of the HUD. And that seems to indicate that they are fully under the control of Sephiroth. These are Sephiroth's whispers that we're dealing with, and we'll get more on that in a minute. Anyway, we head into the reactor. We get a shot above the Gongaga region of one of the Relnickers, Gelnicker, with Scarlet on it, and she's on her way to get some weapon. She's done waiting. She wants to come and get some weapon. So, as you can see, there are multiple parties converging on the Gongaga reactor right now, and shit's about to go down shit is about to go down anyway we go through the reactor we do all of the stuff the climbing more climbing jumping swimming all that sort of business plugging things in dragging things about but eventually we get to the center of the reactor and we see a massive mako pool just there exposed open after the reactor has been destroyed and barrett points out that clearly this means that the planet is recovering right when you get rid of the reactor the mako recovers so this is a good thing right this is a good thing but you've got a massive tornado of whispers swirling over the top of the Mako pool. And then you've also got Scarlet heading down in the Galnica. Relnica, goddammit. She's heading down and she's obviously got the plan to grab the weapon. Loads of Shimra troopers drop in. Scarlet kind of looks down at everything that's going on. And it seems like she can see the whispers, which is interesting. Maybe this is because of the different types of whispers. Anyway, she sends a load of weird monstrous abominations, amalgams to deal with us. She's borrowed some toys off Hojo, clearly. We kill them, deal with everything. And eventually we reach a point where we fight another one of Hojo's pets. We defeat it, and then Cloud starts suffering. He's been around the Mako a lot, he's exhausted himself, and the whispers now start coming for Cloud. Obviously because it's Sephiroth, and he wants to mess with him. And Sephiroth does something to Cloud in this moment. He says, let me help. He reaches out a hand, and we get like a little bit of a Genova flicker that happens. And he does something to Cloud in this moment, and we'll see what he's done soon. We flip back to Gongaga, and the girls decide that, you know, 
something's going wrong over there. There's a lot of noise coming from the reactor. We're seeing a lot of Shinra helicopters over there. So, T for everything you fear, grab some chocobos, grab some grappling guns, thanks Cisne, and we head to the reactor. The team get to the reactor eventually, doing a lot of the same things that we did previously, but with some zip lining added in and some grappling gunning, so that's good. But eventually, the girls reach the center of the reactor and they see what's going on. Cloud is down, on the floor, not in a good state, suffering in a big way. And so Yufe, Tifa and Aerith jump into the fight and take on Scarlet. Now they throw some heavy shade at Scarlet and that distracts her enough so that she's going to attack them. And it buys Barrett, Red and Kate Sith the time to get Cloud and see what's going on with him. Now we beat Scarlet up and eventually we reach a point where Tifa's kind of grappling gunning around, trying to get to Scarlet and finish the job, while Scarlet is trying to use the claw to grab the, the weapon. Tifa gets knocked off the platform, uses the grappling gun, thank you Cisne, swings around, saves herself and Cloud sees what's going on and goes to chase after and, you know, save Tifa. He kind of snaps out of it for a second. But between him and Tifa are a load of Shimra troopers that we saw drop in earlier. And it's in this moment where the let me help you from Sephiroth earlier kicks in. Loads of whispers are swirling around. Sephiroth appears to Cloud again and says, let that righteous anger guide you. And we get the first moment when no one is there to stop Cloud. And he destroys these Shimra troops. He's cocky, he's confident, he's leaning his head out of the way of bullets. He destroys them. And even when they're down, no mercy, just puts his blade through the back of one of them. And this is the cloud that we've not been, not been allowed to see in Remake and up to this point. But there's no one there right now. And the aspects that Sephiroth is trying to push onto Cloud take over. And he just destroys them. He absolutely destroys them. But then Tifa arrives and Sephiroth reaches into Cloud's brain again and starts dropping the same lines that he dropped earlier on in the game in Calm. He tells Cloud not to let Tifa fool him. And then Cloud starts repeating verbatim what Sephiroth says. And it shows that in this moment, Sephiroth has got nearly complete control over Cloud. Now the whispers all disappear, and that suggests to me that Sephiroth's gone in this moment. He's left now. He's done what he needed to do. The impact, however, is still resonating through Cloud. And Cloud parrots the same line that Sephiroth dropped earlier about those we hate, those we love, those we fear. And he swings at Tifa with his sword. Tifa, like, quite deftly dodges out of the way. Like, she does a good job not to end up cutting half air. But the only way that she can dodge is backwards into the open Mako pool. She lands in the pool, pops up to the surface, and starts swimming over towards the group before the weapon bursts out of the water and eats Tifa. It's pretty aggressive. Like, I'm sure a lot of people were very concerned in this moment. And at this point, we get one of the weirder scenes of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and that is this... It's like the live stream scene from Final Fantasy VII, but for Tifa rather than for Cloud. That's what this feels like. This feels like this is the live stream scene. And it's another example of remake and rebirth kind of mirroring what should be in the game, but at different points. Anyway, we're floating through the live stream. We're inside one of the weapons. We see another weapon kind of pull up next to us, just traveling through the live stream. But then we also see whispers, white whispers. Oh, on top of that as well, we heard voices calling to Tifa. And at first, she kind of feels like it's a mum and dad, but I think it's a friends as well that she was with from the event that happened at Mount Nebel when they were kids. Anyway, back to the weapons. We're floating through, and we've got these white whispers following us. And up ahead, we see, like, a barrier of black whispers, the Sephiroth-controlled whispers. And we see the whispers doing battle against each other. And it's super evocative of livestream white and black mega evocative of that and makes me think of that. We are seeing Livestream White and Black kind of playing out in front of us. At the minute these whispers are kind of following the weapons around and they seem to be kind of guided by the planet's mindset at the minute whereas at certain points in the game they seem very definitely to be controlled by Aerith and especially controlled by this potential Omni Aerith that we have. That's kind of like the OG's Aerith still existing within the live stream. 
doing something similar to what Sephiroth's done. Anyway, the fight finishes and the White Whispers seem to win this battle. The Black Whispers disperse and move away. And then we come to the bit of this that makes me think that it is the live stream scene, but for Tifa instead. We come to this point where we've got three memories that we can look over, and if you remember back to the OG in the live stream scene, you've got three memories that you can go over, and these are there to prove to Cloud who he is. Now, the memories in this are slightly different. They seem to predominantly focus around the Mount Nebel incident when they were children. The first memory on the left of the house is Tifa and her friends, and, you know, she's saying that she's going to the mountain, and Cloud tags along, essentially. The second is the promise scene, and then the third one is on the bridge with Cloud saying to Tifa, like, we should turn back, we should go, it's dangerous, but Tifa's pressing on. So, these are some pretty interesting memories that are focused around pretty much that Mount Nebel incident and the promise, and I'm not sure what it's meant to be. I'm not sure if it's meant to be a replacement for the live stream scene, and we're going to get something different in its place in part three, or... Is it like a preparation for the live stream scene? So is this kind of preparing Tifa for what she's going to have to go through in showing Cloud and reminding Cloud and helping Cloud piece together the memories of who he was and who he is? It's, it's a very interesting moment, and it feels like that. It feels like the planet's possibly showing these memories to Tifa to kind of embed them in her mind more and put them at the forefront of her mind so that when it comes time, she's ready to help Cloud. That's what it feels like. Tifa's reasonably convinced that she's dying right now, and I'm gonna be honest, I'd probably think the same thing, like, oh shit, I'm in the afterlife. <laughs> so, you know, I feel it, I feel it. Anyway, moving on. We come to another scene where we see the Black Whispers in a massive spiral, creating a bubble, creating an area of some sort, and the White Whispers again attack the Black Whispers with the weapon giving out like a massive roar, the White Whispers and weapon keep on moving through the live stream. But again, we see another one of these balls form up in front of us, and the Black Whispers attack weapon even harder, and look like they maybe do some damage. But then we see what I think all this was in aid of. I think this ball of Whispers that we keep seeing is trying to summon Sephiroth in the live stream and bring him forwards, and eventually it does, and he, as soon as he appears, goes straight for Tifa straight for Tifa, well straight for the weapon but it pierces that materia, that bubble that Tifa's within and immediately she starts choking on the live stream. Sephiroth keeps going at the weapon and seems like a little bit shocked at how tough it is when he puts his blade in it but eventually he just slices down the side of it and he does quite a bit of damage to this weapon. He does quite a bit of damage and then just kind of lets it go. I, th I think he's reasonably happy at this point that he's weakened it, he's weakened part of the power of the planet, and I do think he is trying to take Tifa out. He knows what Tifa does in the latter stages of the OG, where, you know, piecing Cloud's memory back together and bringing him back from the brink, back to being someone who can defeat Sephiroth. So, he knows that she's vital, and he's trying to take her out. Now, the screen fades to white, and we see... A load of people from Tifa's life that are important to her. We see Zangun, we see Dr. Sharon, we see Aerith, we see Barrett. We don't see Cloud until the end. And when we do see Cloud, he's walking into the light with Sephiroth. And Sephiroth says, your words can't reach him now. So Sephiroth's trying to not only break Cloud and convince Cloud that Tifa isn't trustworthy, but he's trying to push Tifa into despair as well. And sh like showing her that Cloud's gone. She can't save Cloud now. It's 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 futile. But Tifa says something interesting at the end. Don't take him too. And it's pretty indicative of like Tifa's life. She and Cloud lost everything in the Nibelheim incident. And they've built on that since then. Well, Tifa has. Cloud hasn't really. Cloud has a little bit. But they've built on that since then. But they both lost everything. And they only really have a connection to each other to remind them of that childhood and that, that place that they grew up in. So, yeah, I kind of get that Tifa's going to stay resolved on this. I feel like Sephiroth's kind of trying to do something he's not going to be able to pull off. But, anyway, we pop back up to the surface, the weapon appears, and Tifa gets dropped back off at the side of the Mako pool by weapon. And Barrett goes up to Cloud and gives him a swift punch to the face and, like, tells him to get his shit together, basically. I feel like it's needed. I feel like Barrett should do it more often. 
because it works, seemingly, and Cloud gets over there to try and help Tifa. The weapon spews up a load of life stream and white whispers, and floats Tifa down safely before jumping back into the Mako pool, leaving Yuffie depressed and upset at the side of the pool because she didn't get any materia again. Poor Yuffie. The scene ends here with everything a bit of a mess, and we end up back in Gongago with Tifa asleep, just drained completely. Like, she did nearly die, let's be honest. She very nearly died. Like, Sephiroth came super close to achieving his goal there, not just messing with Cloud and getting Cloud to the point where he nearly killed Tifa, but then taking a shot at Tifa himself and nearly managing it. Yeah, Tifa, Tifa went through a lot in that chapter. And we come back to the scene with Cloud watching over Tifa, obviously worried, obviously concerned about what he did. But when Tifa wakes up, she talks about the memory that was just dragged to the forefront of her mind by the live stream and the planet talking about how when they were children they were told that if someone died their spirit would cross Mount Nebel and that was why she went up to Mount Nebel she was looking for a mum and the fact that that memory was dragged to the forefront and she immediately relays it to Cloud probably keeps Cloud together a little bit longer and probably reminds him of like who he is a little bit more I, I, we don't really see anything noticeable or tangible right now but I do think it does help because I don't remember Cloud having another psycho moment for a little while. He definitely has more psycho moments. Let's not underestimate how psychotic Cloud is right now. But I don't think he has one for a while. So I think the planet kind of did what it needed to do in this moment. And not only kind of helping Cloud, but helping Tifa. Because Tifa, from the conversation that we get here, had been told that Cloud was egging her on and trying to get her to keep going. But the vision that we saw in the live stream confirmed to Tifa the truth of what happened there. So she has more faith in Cloud now, which is something that she's going to need going forwards. We finally then get a moment from Cloud where he talks about how he remembers things that he shouldn't and he forgets things that he should remember. And it feels like these different people inside him. And we're finally starting to get some sort of realization from cloud of what he's going through but at this point he misinterprets it and believes that it's soldier degradation because we've had a lot of that pushed into our faces and not us but cloud has had a lot of that pushed into his face by recent events so obviously it's at the forefront of his mind and when his brain starts going and he starts doing weird things he's going to think that he's degraded and we have a nearly close moment between Tifa and Cloud, but it gets ruined by Yuffie and Kate Sith, like, literally pressed against the door listening. I mean, come on, man. A bit of class. A bit of class. We do get a moment here where Aerith mouths something to Tifa, and I have no idea what she says. Like, genuinely, not a clue. So, you know, thoughts in the comments on that one, because I'm not sure. I can't remember if it gets revealed later on in the game. I think, I don't think it does, but I can't remember. We'll keep an eye out for it. Anyway, we go back into the front room as Cloud and there's a big conversation going on about how we've got these horrible whispers that are under the control of Sephiroth going up against the white whispers that are under the control of the planet and Aerith potentially. And Tifa says that she gets the idea that the white whispers are winning and it did seem like they were at this point. But Sephiroth's getting stronger and by the end of the game, he's even stronger. So, you know, things may change. Things may change. Barrett's got faith though. Barrett believes that the planet can win. And, you know, maybe he's right. Maybe we need to give the planet a little helping hand. Anyway, the decision gets made afterwards that we're going to head to Cosmo Canyon, the home of Planetology, to, you know, have a little chat about things and see what's going on and maybe learn some stuff and take Red 13 home. And, yeah, the next chapter, oh, there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen. But, we've got side quests to do now. We've got side quests, and I'm going to be honest with you, I hate the side quests in Gongaga, like, with a passion. With a passion. First off, we've got this abomination of a side quest, which is the chicken fetching game. Like, come on, man. Why are you doing this to me? It's painful. It's clunky. It took me more than one attempt. I hated every second of it. Never again. Never again. Never again am I going through this. Oh my god awful and there's not even really a narrative payoff for it there's just there's just nothing some old birds like oh thank you and that's it well i mean i suppose we got some grilled chicken and red's a little bit traumatized after the whole incident 
Eh, I suppose there's some benefit to it, but still, I hated it. Next up, we help out a guy who's kind of living in the forest, making weapons, Ezo, and he's trying to make the ultimate weapon, and he gets all excited when he sees Barrett's gun arm and adapter. So we go and get some resources, we come back, he makes us a gun. But he has one interesting thing to say where he points out to Barrett that the adapter that he's got is kind of thinking of his future in a way, because, yeah, he needs a gun now, but in the future he might not need a gun. And the adapter gives him that option to put the gun down and put something else there, maybe in more peaceful times. And it's a cool little message that gets to Barrett a little bit. I, I like it. It was a good little moment. This one wasn't too bad. It was nice and quick as well. You just have to follow the pictures and, you know, it's easy enough. It's easy enough. Next up, we have to help this kid do some training, Satetsu. He's part of the defense force, the Gongaga defense force. And we find out as the quest continues that he's an old friend of Zack's. And, you know, he's trying to be like Zack. And it's, it's fun that we have Cloud, who's kind of trying to portray as many Zackisms as possible. That's kind of his vibe at the minute, all the Zackisms. And, you know, him and Satetsu kind of connect with each other and they have a little chat. Stood outside Zack's training spot, you know, his secret training spot that everybody knew about. And he shows us Zack's favourite exercise, the squats, and Cloud's like, oh, no, 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 let me show you how that's done. And he jumps in and shows Satetsu how to do the true Zack squat. So... Yeah, it's a fun yet weird yet haunting little moment, this. It's sad and it's touching and it's wholesome. It, it, it's a lot of things all at the same time, this scene. The quest itself was a bit of a pain, though. Because I'm really strong playing through it, like level 70 strong, it was really difficult for me to stagger the enemies while playing through it because I was just kind of one-shotting them. So that was fun. Got there in the end, though. Anyway, we beat the boss, we head back to town, and Satetsu's trying to hire us to train them, and Cloud's like, bro, we're passing through, we're literally passing through, we're not staying here to train you how to be a soldier. And in an attempt to make him go away, Cloud's like, right, fine, we'll do it, but for a million gil. And Satetsu's like, yeah, yeah, I think I can pull that off. And Cloud's like, oh, shit, we're stuck here forever. But then Satetsu's friends come out of nowhere, and they're like, we're not paying that, mate. And then Cisne comes out, and she basically says, like, bro, I'm stood here. I'll train you. I'll train you better than this clown. And she's probably not wrong. I, I don't get the feeling that Cloud would be a very good instructor. Whereas I feel like Cisne would probably be quite good at it. So, yeah, Cisne takes over and offers to train them up and make them strong and make them useful so that they can protect Gongaga. And we get to leave. Uh, Satetsu just kind of throws a little bit of shade at us, like, oh, maybe you should charge a bit less next time, you know, you might get some work, and we're like, bro, we're trying to leave, shut up and go away. Oh, and Yuffie, again, didn't get any materia. Excellent. The final little side quest that we have to do in the Gongaga region is to help Cisne. She's trying to make some Gongaga mushroom soup and failing miserably at it from the looks of it. Uh, so we offer to go out and like get some ingredients to help Cisne, and Aerith offers to help out when we get the ingredients. Getting the ingredients isn't too bad. I mean, it's a little bit of a pain. There's some old guy that we go and see to get some ingredients. And he's like, oh, you're from the big city. Get away. Uh, but then eventually he softens to us after Aerith kind of talks him around. And we have to follow a dog to get some ingredients. We do all the things. We got all the ingredients. And we head back. Aerith helps Cisne cut the mushroom soup. And it actually turns out not too bad. The black smoke goes away. So that's a good sign. It shows that we're not burning things. Yeah. It was all good. Cisne and Aerith have a little bonding session and Cisne lets slip a couple of times that she worked for the company, meaning Shinra. You know, she talks about rations, military rations that they get in clouds like, whoa, what are you talking about the Bomberry military rations? And she's like, yeah, 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 them. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, mm, never mind. So, you know, she lets it slip and Cloud would have to be super dumb not to realise. But yeah, that's the end of the side quest in the Gongaga region. We've had a little bit of fun with Cisne. We will be back here later on in the game when we get a couple more side quests that open up. But all there is to do now is to head to the airfield and uh, meet Sid, I think. I, th I think we should go to the airfield and meet Sid. So that's what we do. Now, we were told earlier on to go to the airfield and we'd be able to find a pilot who just kind of does his thing. And we learned that these are free flyers who don't really work for anybody and they kind of do what they want to do. They don't listen to Shimra because Shimra tries to control the skies, obviously. And it's Sid, and everybody loves Sid. So we get to the airfield, and we send up a smoke signal to let Sid know that someone's waiting for a journey. He turns up, he says that there's maybe a few too many of us, but we should be able to manage it. And 
that's it. We've got a pilot. We have got a pilot. We don't really chat to Sid too much at this point. Later on, we get a bit deeper into conversation with Sid. But at this point, we literally just pay him for a flight. He's a taxi driver. He's an Uber driver at this point. Air Uber. That's what he is. So we jump on. We sit where he tells us to so we get the balance right. And we take off and head for Cosmo Canyon. We then close off the chapter with the final scene, which cuts to Midgar and to Hojo's lap. And we see Roche is lay on a surgery table and he's clearly going through soldier enhancements. And Hojo even says that since Roche has kind of come to him of his own volition rather than being, you know, an unwilling torture subject, because Roche has kind of come of his own accord, he's going to give him the special treatment. So, a lot of stuff's happening with Roche, and we'll see more about that a little bit later on in the game. But Hojo also kind of flexes that this was something that would have taken years in the past, but now it takes a few hours, a day, maybe, and he can get all of this done. And then he also goes on some little weird kind of admiration rant about Genova and about how he could never expect to improve upon perfection, and how he'd never want to do that. It's a very weird moment. It's another glimpse into how much of a crazy bastard Hojo is. So, a lot more to come from this. A lot more crazy Hojo stuff and a lot more Roche stuff. But this is what we finish off chapter 9 with. So, there's a lot of pretty interesting stuff that goes on in this chapter. It all tends to be pretty heavily front-loaded to the start of the chapter, as it has been with the last couple. All of the stuff that goes on with Weapon at the Reactor is quite interesting. The stuff that goes on between Sephiroth and Tifa in the livestream is also very interesting. And the fact that, like I say, we kind of get a almost a placeholder for the livestream scene. Or we get a new livestream scene that's put in place to make Tifa... Not make her do anything, but reinforce the memories that she has that she's going to need later on to fix Cloud. Either that... Or maybe this is the live stream scene and part three goes off the rails like a lot of us are expecting. I, I still can't see us not having a live stream scene for Cloud though. Like that feels crazy to me. It is one of the most important scenes in the entire game. So yeah, I can't see that not happening. So I think it's the first one to be honest. I think it's a, a warm up for the live stream scene and it's done to reinforce those memories in Tifa so that she's ready when she needs to be. That, that's what I think it is and it does the job. It does the job. And in that moment in Gongaga afterwards, I feel like Tifa sharing that memory with him brings Cloud back from the brink a little bit. Not much, obviously, but a little bit. A little bit. So, yeah, really interesting chapter. A lot of cool stuff. Cool to see Cisne. Cool to see Cisne doing a thing and, like, helping Gongaga out and doing, doing what she thinks Zack would be doing because she obviously knows what's happened to Zack. Or at least she should know. I'm pretty confident that she knows what's happened to Zack. So that's why she's here in Gongaga. She's kind of fulfilling that role of Zack, who would potentially have been there, like, protecting his home. Yeah, that's what it feels like to me. We'll get more on Cisne later on anyway. Let me know what you thought about this chapter. Let me know any thoughts that you may have on any of the stuff that goes down, be it with the weapon, be it with the live stream scene, be it with Crazy Cloud, where Sephiroth kind of imprints himself on Cloud for a little bit. And we see Cloud just absolutely chew through those Shimra troops and kind of flip. That's a scary moment, that, because, you know, that's Sephiroth taking over. Anyway, drop your thoughts in the comments below, like the video, subscribe to the channel for more, share the video around, but more importantly than all of that, have a great day.